When I was a kid, when we grew up on the farm, it was like so much freedom. Freedom that a child should have. We got to climb trees and play in the mud and take our bikes and go swim at the dam and go fishing. I still harbor so much nostalgia for it. Living in one of the most remarkable places with the bush around you and the sound of Africa going to sleep or the sound of Africa waking up in the morning. It's a love for my country. It's a place that I belong. And I still feel that, despite all. It's a very unique country. It's an ex-colony. It had quite a significant number of white people who were maybe second generation or maybe third generation who had already put down roots. They didn't count themselves British anymore. They were, you know, a white African. Barbara and I have been friends for 25 years. We recognised sort of kindred spirits between us, that we weren't the traditional Zimbabwean farmers' wives, we were a little bit more independent. My husband and I, we had children, and the safety and sanctity that home, you know, gives you, and a sense of belonging to a place. This farm school that we went to was like out in the bush. Half the time we didn't wear shoes, and anyone was friends, didn't matter who you were or what you were. I never saw colour. I was eight years old when the government changed from minority to majority government, and I'm more proud to be a Zimbabwean than I ever was a Rhodesian, even despite being born in the Rhodesian era. First and foremost, I'm Zimbabwean. Do swear that I will well and truly serve Zimbabwe in the office of Minister of the Government. So help me God. Democracy was a totally foreign concept to the African culture. The African culture is one where the chief is the ruler and there's no one man, one vote voting process. ZANU PF failed one million six hundred and sixty-eight thousand nine hundred. I do hope that uh, those of you with land to spare can allocate it to the state. We are not seizing it. We are buying it from you. And we would want you to be understanding on that subject. The trouble with absolute power is it tends to, in the famous words, corrupt absolutely. And it went very quickly wrong when they decided that no one else could have a look in to the power that they had won through the barrel of the gun. The general black population in Zimbabwe has no problem with white Zimbabweans being white Zimbabweans. It's the government that has a problem with that. I point a finger squarely and fairly at Mugabe. You know, a lot of people seem to think that Mugabe was this amazing man right from the start, you know, that he fought for the liberation of his people and he was such a great guy. And, but actually, Mugabe with the genocide against the Ndebele, he was already massacring and, and committing genocide against his people right in 1980. Just before the parliamentary election, in the year 2000, Mugabe decided to put together a new constitution that would entrench his power. And the sweetener for that was that they would be given land for free. We thought the, the population would just vote yes, but they all voted no. And there was no change in the constitution. I can remember seeing President Mugabe on the TV after that referendum, and his very words verbatim were, I will 
respect the will of the people. Two weeks later, the dogs were let out, and oh my word. Within two weeks, the farm invasions began, and that was the start of the lawlessness on all of our farms. We were enemies of the state. He said that himself. The de Klerk family are enemies of the state. You really have behaved uh, as enemies of Zimbabwe, that, that uh, we are full of anger, and the, our entire community is angry. And this is why you have the war veterans now, you know, seizing land. The first farm takeovers, I heard about people on the other side of the country, but there's no one I knew. And it was like something that you don't really think about as a kid. I remember saying to Gavin when the first land invasion started, Gavin promised me we won't risk our lives for this farm. It's not worth it. Land is not worth dying for. You promise we won't do it. And he said yes. But you know what? You hear about other people in other areas being attacked and how they were marched off their farms or how they were beaten as they had to leave their farms or how they were killed. And you just wait to see if it's going to be you. My brother and I used to go for bike rides to my grandparents' house and I mean, there were kids who used to like shout at us and say hello, hello, give them a bike ride. But then that, that, that dynamic changed and then we'd actually be too scared to go because we thought like, what if they throw stones at us? Like they might actually do something to us. And we were like aware that we're different to them. I remember the farmers in the club saying, oh, you know, if they try and take our farms, Britain won't allow it. And I laughed at the time and I said to them, of course Britain will allow it. They'll come and send in their news crews and they'll make money out of this. You have people posted to your front gate, you know have the potential to harm you and your family, or they can throw you out of your house, or they can beat you, they can urinate on you. And you have absolutely no recourse to any protection. When the war veterans once again took the lead, that when Joshua farms occupy them, I said, no policeman shall remove them from those farms. Firstly, you don't have anywhere to go. This is your country. You don't know what the rules of engagement are, but you do know one thing, that your fear builds up. We will remain here till we die. Two years, six months, we had a constant occupation of our home. They cut down a few trees and closed the road off, so I couldn't leave. They cut the phones. Nobody was allowed to come to the house, and I wasn't allowed to leave. And I stayed there for eight days with them outside. And they said to me that, you can leave this house naked, or we'll kill you. I will sleep here until you are out. And I mean it. I want you out. Our children grew up knowing that everybody who should protect them weren't going to be able to do it. So as parents, we didn't have the ability to protect our children from dying. I had turned 14 about a month and a half before. We'd been back at school for a week and then we went home that Friday. It was the 23rd of January. We'd been to Harare, Barbara and I, on the Friday afternoon. And I'd gone to change money. It was the last money Gavin and I had after being thrown off our farm. We were trying to make wine out of apples because we'd lost our grape farm. And we got home that evening and the Pattersons came for dinner. We'd been swimming all day and I just had my swimming costume on, like just kids playing in the pool. And um, we all wanted to watch this movie called Shanghai Noon, it was a Jackie Chan movie and we were super excited about it. We just sat down for a meal and six armed people walked into our house. And I remember Kors looking up, his face just lost colour and he said, oh my God, it's our turn. They had their weapons and they walked directly towards us. We knew who they were. It was part of an operation set up by a couple of government officials called Operation Get Up and Go. And they knew that if they hit the white people who were still hanging in there, 
they would leave if you personally went for their families? First, a few hits to the head, because that's just there to make you submissive. And they tied everybody up with wires and made them lie face down on the floor, including the children. So I sort of took over and said, you can have anything you want, but you just don't touch my family. You know, we were all afraid and we were all holding hands. If one of us gets killed, I think it'll be all of us. They had put the gun to the head of the seven-year-old and then say, right, if you don't give us your money, he's going first. We're going to take him outside and shoot him. So I said, yes, there's some money upstairs in the cupboard. I'll go and get it. He goes and he just throws the money at my husband and says, is this all you've got? You know, I mean, this is not enough. And then they took my daughter. I didn't understand why at the time, but my mom was like, no, 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 don't take her, don't take her. And everyone was like panicking that they were taking me aside, separate to everyone, and I was like, and like a cold rush went through me, and I suddenly, for some reason, felt, I was like, I'm just in my swimming costume. And he like pinned me against the wall, and he like put his hand on the waistband of my my pants and... And I remember hearing Tia crying. And there was nothing you could do, you were tied up. You know, you could only just keep pleading with the man who was still with you in the lounge, please don't hurt her, she's just a child. They said to her, do you know what rape is? She says, yeah, she knows what rape is. She says, do you know what AIDS is? Yes, we know what AIDS is. Well, we're gonna, we've got AIDS and we're gonna rape you. And if you don't tell us where your parents keep their money, we're going to rape you until you do, and we're all going to rape you until you do. It's not, you know, you're just a 14-year-old girl, and I was always a romantic at heart and always, like, had a thought about how my life would be. And I was always, like, quite shy. And that kind of, you know, that kind of took that all away from me, you know. Because I was just a kid. And by some miracle, the one who was trying to rape her couldn't rape her. I don't actually know what stopped him. <laughs> I've never actually ever been able to talk about it properly. Not even to any, like, you know, we went to counsellors afterwards. It's just um, like that sort of feeling, it feels like, you know, when you talk about it, you're there again. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it hurts a lot. It's, um, I can't, it's actually, talk about it. And that was the end of our life on a farm, you know. Today you have become a friend and ally with the same national interest, loyalty, rights and duties as myself. Today you cannot avoid the love that binds you to me and me to you. For 16 years now, we've been going through a process of ethnic cleansing. More than 90% of our white population has been forced to flee the country. Over 95% of the farmers have been systematically and lawlessly removed from their farms. <laughs> If what had happened now in Zimbabwe had been the other way around, there would have been a world outcry. Racism is only seen as white on black. Justice will prevail one day. You can't have reconciliation unless you've had justice.
One of the greatest tragedies of the Zimbabwe situation is the effect it had on families, marriages. Most of my friends, it's destroyed marriages. Losing the farm had a lot to do with the breakdown of my marriage. When you're a man in a traditional Afrikaans system, there's some old values there that a man is a provider. He is the head of the family. And when you have to go through the kind of undignifying processes that we went through, he couldn't protect his family. He couldn't protect his home. I think the greatest pain is, you know, the, the loss of your community. It just seemed yesterday that I walked on a bare piece of earth and I was a young person with, you know, all my dreams. The dreams that everybody wants for their life. I remember when that piece of earth was just bare and laying out the strings and they had the strings of hope for your life, the things you aspire to. Moving in there and it wasn't finished when we moved in because we didn't have the money. But, you know, we always made the best of everything and we used our ingenuity to make it a beautiful place that was ours. And everything we did with our own hands, and that was part of the satisfaction of it. It was just something we did together. That's, that's where you abandoned. It's not, it's not the government, you know. It's... You don't fit anywhere, you know. You don't, um, no one actually cares. Mm -hmm.